डॉक्टर डॉक्टर मंजू शर्मा डॉक्टर मधुरा स्वामीनाथन डॉक्टर अजय फरीदा वेरी मेनी डिस्टिंग्विश साइंटिस्ट हेयर हु आर ऑल्सो माई पर्सनल फ्रेंड्स द डायरेक्टर चंद्र विक्र सैद डॉक्टर ब्रोज आलबर्ट्स एंड बेटी आलबर्ट्स एंड मेनी अदर्स फैक्ट स्टार्ट नेमिंग एवरी वन हैज बीन अ लाइफ लॉन्ग नॉट ओनली फ्रेंड फिलासफर एंड गाइड टू मी मोस्ट ऑफ दम हॉर हेयर I am particularly moved by the love and affection of all the MSSRF, what we call members of the family of the MSSRF, and I express my gratitude for all the kindness which have been shown. Recently, Dr. Ayyappan had asked me to address the 25th anniversary of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences on what he called my own experience in research. So I gave delivered a lecture called "65 Years of Adventure in Agricultural Research and Development." Many of my young colleagues here and students of MSRF, when they heard about it, because it was on the I think Dr. David Bergenson had put in his own website also a Wikisat. They asked me whether I will repeat that lecture today. So I am going to more or less, more or less uh, say what I said earlier, with some modifications. Uh, to so the present audience so those who have heard me before will bear with me that uh, what i am going to say is a sort of a narration of the ex- excitement of science of excitement of doing science particularly in the field of agriculture the, well i started uh, i was a student of the agricultural college at coimbatore which is now an agriculture Tamil Nadu Agriculture University one of the old agricultural colleges along with Lalpur Kanpur Nagpur and uh, Pune these were the early agricultural colleges set up by Lord Curzon in 1905 uh, after that from there i went to the Indian Agriculture Research Institute because i had fallen in love with genetics and breeding i wanted to do the postgraduate work on genetics and breeding Incidentally, can you hear me at the end? Is the voice enough? Is it audible? Okay, yes. audible. Huh? Uh, well, I, when I joined the IARI in 1947, the year of our independence, Dr. B. P. Paul was then the head of the department of what we now call genetics. It was then called botany division, and of course, the IARI library tower is well known everywhere. It is used in stamps and so on. my research work there for the associateship of iri was on non tuber bearing solanums particularly solanum melangena or bengan as we call them now it has been in the news because of bt <laughs> bt brinjal uh, but bt brinjal made brinjal famous but brinjal is a very important component of our diet in our country that is what my th- i found uh, dr prabhu showed me the thesis which is there kept in the Uh, in the library of the botany division or genetics division of iri it was an interesting study the next one when i w- next when i when i was in the 1949 at iri i got a fellowship from unesco to go to holland it was called unesco netherlands government fellowship to continue my studies there when i went there professor r prak and a very famous cytogeneticist they have was given a room in the department of genetics which uh, you see the building here and i was told that can you work on potatoes in sabrunjal which is in india can you work on tuber bearing solanums because we have a problem of uh, nematode problem uh, in the this is the famous golden nematode of potato after world war 2 the dutch as you know i don't know whether anybody is here are very very good agronomists they always follow a crop rotation they don't grow the same crop one after the other but during the world war there was no other option potato after potato potato after potato with the result the golden nematode got built up in the soil so i was asked whether i could uh, develop a resistant line uh, using a species called solanum polyadenium from the peru bolivian region which had resistance to golden nematode it was a complex cross i won't go into details of it but it was a very exciting exciting situation 
1950, I decided to do my PhD at Cambridge University in, uh, in England. I had a fellowship to go there from Holland. Professor Prakan also said that the Dutch PhD takes a long time. <laughs> it takes five, six years. You have to produce a book and so on. So why don't you go to uh, Cambridge? And there also they continue the same work because there was a very big collection of tuber-bearing solanums there what was called the J.G. Hawkes collection or the Commonwealth Potato Collection which was there and uh, my thesis I was in the, each I was the Fitzwilliam College which was good enough to elect me as a fellow of the college normally in Cambridge to be elected as a fellow of the college is a great honor well there was a, as I said Dr. J.G. Hawkes on behalf of the Commonwealth at that time it was not Commonwealth it was British Empire it was called the British Empire potato collecting expedition and he went around the whole of Latin America collected a large number of tubers of various shapes and kinds if you see the extent of variability genetic variability it's called the J.G. Hawkes collection and my thesis was copies here in my room species differentiation and the nature of polyploidy in certain species of the genus Solanum with particular reference to the origin of Solanum tuberosum it has been published as a monograph the book itself. From here I went to the University of Wisconsin because I published a few papers which attracted attention and I was asked whether I can come as a research associate in genetics in the University of Wisconsin department. I shared a room with one very famous geneticist Jim Crow, a wonderful man, uh, James Crow, a uh, human geneticist and it was a wonderful experience. That's where I first met, met Dr. Borlaug also. He had come for a meeting uh, at the University of Wisconsin, or American Institute of Biological Sciences meeting, where he gave a lecture. Main work I did, I did at mainly at Sturgeon Bay, uh, because the Potato Introduction Station was at Sturgeon Bay, was again developing new new genetic strains of potato. Uh, some recombinant uh, DNA work, not the genetic modification, but other methods of using transfer of genes across sexual barriers, mainly mm -hmm. uh, one of the important crosses I made at that time was from Solana Macaulay, which is highly resistant to frost. Frost resistance, and those of you who know the Midwest of the United States or Canada, you require frost resistance, very cold during the winter months. And uh, I developed a method to overcome uh, the difficulties of transfer of genes by what was called artificial stigma. If recombinant DNA technology was there, it would have been much easier. But then we have to try many other methods of crossing species uh, across sexual barriers so that you have novel genetic combinations. Well, that led to a variety. It was bred in Sajowa, uh, uh, bred uh, Alaska frostless. In Alaska it was bred, it's called Alaska frostless. I returned to the India early in 1954 and joined the Central Rice Research Institute at Katak. Uh, Dr. K. Ramaya was not the director, Dr. Parthasarathy was the director, but Dr. K. K. Ramaya had started a program called the Indica Japanica Hybridization Program. I consider that to be the first serious attempt to develop what we call high yielding varieties. Transfer genes from Japanica for fertilizer response to Indica and also the short height, the plant architecture. CRRI, uh, I, I therefore always say, uh, in this country was the starting point of the yield revolution. The yield revolution is another term for green revolution. Uh, when William Gard coined the term green revolution, it was to indicate uh, improvement of yield, productivity, production through productivity improvement, not through area expansion. You can do both of them. Dr. K. Ramaya was a great visionary and uh, his books on rice are still classic and as I said the beginning of the yield revolution uh, started in the fields of CRRI Katak the early. Meanwhile the government of India at that time was very concerned with food. Many of you have heard the oft repeated statement by Nehru that everything else can wait but not agriculture because our independence was born in the backdrop of the great Bengal famine and where millions of people died and that that's why Nehru's time, the emphasis was on infrastructure for modern agriculture, particularly irrigation. But he believed in large dams. He had went to the United States 
and so Buck, uh, very large multi-purpose projects. So he wanted to have similar ones like Bakra and so on, which is power generation, uh, irrigation, and also for drinking water, uh, what, what Nehru called the new temples of India. The other important thing he started in his time was fertilizer production. Uh, we didn't, although fert mineral fertilizer use started in Europe in Liebig's time, uh, in the 80s, 1850s, 1860s, we didn't have mineral fertilizer. We used to have organic manure, green manure and so on, dencha. They were used, but not the... Uh, but uh, when Nehru, Nehru thought we should modernize our agriculture and therefore uh, more fertilizer factories were started. Some of them in the cooperative sector, IFCO for example, IFCO and Kripco are doing very well, not only in terms of fertilizer production, but in terms of extension, extension of knowledge. They have training, they have foundation, so on. And the famous words of, uh, of uh, I think it was Dr. K. Ramaya, Indian soils are hungry and thirsty. You, you must quench their hunger, you must also quench their thirst before you can produce more, because inputs are needed for output. So uh, the government of India started a program called Intensive Agriculture District Program. It was also called Package Program, uh, launched in 1960-61. The major aim of this program was to maximize the benefits of our investment in water and fertilizer. We were investing in water and fertilizer. What is the benefit we get from the point of view of agricultural production? So by 1963-64, 15 districts were covered. Unfortunately, an analysis showed, I also made an analysis of the results of IADP published somewhere in the 60s. Uh, unfortunately, it showed the yield improvement we expected from IADP didn't happen because the package of practices missed one important ingredient, namely a genetic strain which can respond to the rest of the package because unless you have a strain which can respond to water and fertilizer. That was what was good, made good by the introduction of uh, dwarfing genes, both in the case of wheat and rice. In the case of the dwarfing genes for wheat, originally it came from in a, in, 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 in Azuka from Norin experiment station. That's why they are called Norin, the RH genes. But then later on we get, got it through Dr. Norman Borlaug in Mexico. He sent us the spring wheat, because the earlier ones with Dr. Orville Vogel in Washington state were all winter wheats, and we can't grow winter wheats, and therefore the spring wheats came. Similarly, we were fortunate at the same time, dwarf wheats of rice also came. One set came from Taiwan, tai, tai Chung Native One, Tainan, and so on. The other one came from Erie, the International Rice Research Institute, things like which led to IR8, uh, those kinds of varieties. But anyway, in both wheat and rice, uh, s s suddenly in the mid-60s, we had an architectural change, the, the genetic architecture as well as the anatomical architecture of the plant was changed and you had a new kinds of plant types, what we call new kinds of plant type, with a very high harvest index. In other words, most of the photosynthesis were being translocated to the grains, not to the uh, straw and so on. And the high harvest index gave it a high yield. Well, this was a picture of Norman Borlaug. He first visited us. I had met him in Wisconsin, but he first visited us in 1963. Afterwards, he almost came throughout, uh, throughout his life to India, became a great friend of India. Next to him was one Glenn Anderson, who is a Canadian, who joined us in the wheat program. Unfortunately, he died rather early. Wonderful man, great man. Uh, he was loved by our, all of our workers, co-workers, Glenn Anderson. And of course, we were uh, going through the fields all the time. The other thing which was clear from even Borlaug's work in the early work, he said you have to be very careful about rust disease. The stem rust, the leaf rust, and the stripe rust. So when we started the high yielding varieties program in these crops, we started designing uh, new kinds of gene gene deployment strategy, or what I call genetic checkmating. Genetic checkmating of new disease threats. What kind of strain, what kind of uh, strain of uh, the rust we have to combat. Uh, so you will find here, uh, I won't go into detail, the, for the leaf rust, what we have to do. This gene will have to count checkmate the other <laughs> leaf rust race and so on. The genetic checkmating of uh, rust became a very important component of our work. 
Well, innovations in the 1960s, in which, which I was personally involved, synergy between technology and public policy, one an extension when we, when we knew that we have new kinds of plant type and new opportunities for higher yield, I proposed to the government to, to start what we call national demonstrations. These are documented, they became a turning point. Then we are organized, our farmers were very, sometimes very skeptical of getting four tons, five tons and stuff, half a, half a ton. And therefore we started, uh, I remember there was one Pandya who from, from Gujarat, who was the leader of the farmers, with his help like Mr. Javandia here, many farmers are here, I'm happy to see. We started a national tonnage club of farmers. Uh, we had this launching of this tonnage club in Bhopal. There was a lot of discussion. What is the eligibility to become a member of the tonnage club? Some of them said half a ton. <laughs> we started with half a ton, ended with two tons. Those who produce two tons per hectare are eligible to become members of the national tonnage club of farmers. So slowly the idea of a yield, higher yield came. Then we had a problem of seeds because IARI, he had distinguished oil director, Dr. A, uh, Prabhu, Dr. Singh are here. The IARI and for, well, does have very limited land. It is in the heart of the city. And therefore we had to produce seeds quickly. There was a very big demand for new seeds. And there was always all kinds of accusation. Steels are, seeds are being stolen from IARI and so on. Therefore we had to go to a village the Jonti Seed Village, but Seed Village become, became a very important one. The other day we told the Chief Minister of, 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 Andhra, of Andhra and uh, that if they want to produce more pulses, they will have to organize pulses seed villages. The seed villages beginning the Jonti Village, the seed. At the same time, uh, synergy between technology and public policy is essential to make progress because technology can show how to in increase the production. But only public policy can make farmer confident that by increasing it doesn't suffer. Somebody will buy it, procurement, purchase and procurement. Procurement at the minimum support price, which should be a reasonable price, is very important. What is a reasonable price? As you know, my ideas are different. But anyway, uh, it is not the occasion to discuss. Some day or the other, I am sure our formula of C2 plus 50 will be adopted. There is no other way. Minimum support price, public procurement and public distribution. These became important components of public policy. The Food Corporation of India was set up, the National Seeds Corporation of India was set up and so on. And innovations were bridging the know-how, do-how gap because there was very high gap between know-how, the scientist know-how and the field level do-how. We had to devise in all the ways, lab to lab, coordinated research network, lab to land, national demonstrations land to lab, learning from farmers, giving them the varieties and asking them whether the quality, cooking quality is good. The home science colleges were involved in assessing the quality of the grain, consumer quality and adaptation. Finally, land to land, which MSSR is doing in a big way, under the leadership of Dr. Ajay Parida, is the land to land, uh, well, there is one lady who runs a wonderful farm school, Kalibani Rajendran, is she here? Kalibani? Somewhere she oh, is here. Give her a big clap because she is transferring her knowledge to a lot of not only women but men farmers. It is learning from farmer to farmer. In other words, there is a high credibility in terms of particularly economics because sometimes the farmers don't believe the agronomist economics but they believe the other far, farmers economics. Well, in my years in IARI, as I have been in IARI from 1954. But I became director in 1966 to 72. One of the first things I did in those days, support to agricultural research was not much. Therefore, how do you strengthen our the nuclear research laboratory, a gamma garden? It was called a gamma field, a 200 curie cobalt 60 source. The water technology center was set up with the help of the Ford Foundation. That was the first uh, one. Uh, we didn't have the normal method uh, prefabricated. It was the first prefabricated building uh, in IRA compound, the Water Technology Center. And of course the Division of Genetics where I work, we try to strengthen them. But now IRA has uh, enormously strengthened itself. But the Pulses Laboratory is very important. At that time we decided that we should grow not only wheat and rice, jowar and bajra, but to give more emphasis on pulses. And so a Pulses Research Laboratory was set up. Well, I said... 
uh, whatever we accomplish in the field is ultimately the product of synergy between technology and public policy. At that time, we were very, in the 60s, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, we have Prime Minister who comes from a family like Nehru with a great deal of respect and faith in science and a minister, Bharat Ratna C. Subramanian, who, who had, I must say, <laughs> looking back, he had such a great faith in scientists, what they say. He used to overrule administrators and take what scientists said. So we were fortunate to have this combination of a good technological background and a good, good public policy background. Whatever we suggested, uh, Subramanian had set up a small scientific advisory group and whatever we suggested, he used to take immediately immediate action. He had a secretary, Mr. Vangatramanan, who lives in Chennai, a uh, very capable person. Immediately they used to take action. Uh, next day, today you say something, next day it will be done. It was clear to me at that time, even 1968, that we must look at sustainability of production, not only production, productivity improvement. So sustainability of production, that is a talk I gave at the Indian Science Congress at Varanasi, in January 1968. It was before the term Green Revolution was coined. Green Revolution was coined October 68. This lecture was on January 3rd. Those who are interested can go through, but it was a warning that if you don't take into account ecological considerations, uh, varietal diversity, genetic diversity, and uh, not over-exploitation of groundwater, no excessive use of pesticide and fertilizer, integrated pest management, more of eco-technologies and so on, that is normally these days considered to be, I then called it a term uh, because Green Revolution was becoming very popular, was very media savvy term, the Green Revolution. So I call, I coined another term called Evergreen Revolution. In other words, improvement of productivity in perpetuity without ecological harm. That's very important. And uh, because now, give one example, why we need productivity improvement, the world requires about 50% more rice in 2030 than in 2004, with approximately 30% less arable land today. In other words, productivity improvement is the only pathway available. There is no way, there is no use in saying uh, green revolution is bad. Uh, and uh, Of course, uh, evergreen revolution is what I advocate. In other words, you marry ecology in technology development. Ecology and technology has not two sides of the coin. Uh, they become two sides of the coin, same coin. Well, I, I was asked in 1972 by Mr. Fakhruddin Ali Ahmad, who was then the minister, uh, to move into the Krishi Bhavan as Director General of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And in my years there, in Krishi Bhavan, both as uh, DGICR and uh, Principal Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Mr. Muraji Deshai appointed me as Principal Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture. In those days, <coughs> some of the things which we did to strengthen agriculture research because agriculture research means it didn't have much prestige. So first thing I thought in agriculture research service, people here everywhere, if you see in Tamil Nadu, they will put IAS in the bag because they are proud of the fact they belong to the Indian administrative service. I wanted a breed of scientists who will be proud of the fact that they are members of the agriculture research service, ARS. And ARS fortunately went through with great difficulty. A uh, lot of opposition from government, uh, government, I won't go into, but fortunately uh, the Indira Gandhi uh, and Babu Jagjivan Ram, they both gave uh, great support. Agriculture Research Scientist Recruitment Board, which is still functioning, because we wanted to have our own board, and National Academy of Agriculture Research Management, like what they have in Missouri. Uh, my model was the National Defense College in Delhi, uh, very good college. Uh, we wanted to set up something like the National Defense College, a National Academy for Agriculture Research Management. It is doing well. Then our <laughs> Director General is here, establishment of ICRISAT. This, this was done within the third week of my joining as DJYCR. <laughs> I joined on January 14th, February 10th or 12th, we got the cabinet appro approval for establishing ICRISAT. Krishi Vigyan Kendras, methods of learning by doing, learning by doing, not by lecturing. And then finally, uh, every fourth year, third year used to be aberrant monsoon. In fact, in my lecture, Sadar Patel Memorial Lectures of the All India Radio, delivered in 1973, you will find one whole second, second lecture was on monsoon management, on climate management, monsoon management. Because it was clear, a country like India, we must maximize the benefits of a good monsoon and minimize the adverse impact 
of abnormal monsoon. We should we have to learn both of them, uh, how to maximize the benefits of good monsoon. So these are some of the ideas. Then when Indira Gandhi came back to power, she asked me to shift to the planning commission. We were only three of us at that time, Dr. Manmohan Singh and Mohammed Fasal and I. We joined the planning commission when we uh, worked on the six fire plan where I was involved. Uh, my contribution to the six fire plan was two new chapters. One was environment. For the first time, if you look at the first fire plans, there will be no chapter environment. Second was women and development, the engendering of women. These two were new chapters introduced the six fire plan. A half a chapter in under the employment, I wrote a new deal for the self-employed. You always give them new deals for employed. <laughs> Every few years you set up a pay commission and so on. But what about the self-employed who are the majority of the people in this country? What is the kind of policy you should have towards them? And then we started the National Biotechnology Board uh, for the first time. It was a board at the time. It was not a department of biotechnology because uh, Indira Gandhi, as he told you, had a great faith in science and she felt biotechnology, space technology, all of them must get very much strong support and nuclear technology, nuclear energy, atomic energy and so on. I was the first chairman of the National Biotechnology Board. Then it was when Rajiv Gandhi's time it was made a department of biotechnology and of course very distinguished uh, member, secretary of the Envi Department of Biotechnology, Dr. Manju Sharma is here. National Science and Technology Entrepreneurship Development Board. These days we hear very, a lot of it. In fact, Dr. Manju Sharma was the secretary of the cabinet advisory, science advisory committee. This morning of the meeting is over, next morning she will give the printed copy of the minutes. She will go to INSDAC and get it printed and bring it over because they are all documents, they are all uh, public documents. Well, one of the things which I did when I was in the planning commission, uh, Indira Gandhi one day gave me a small slip from Vinoba Bhavai. Vinoba Bhavai asked her to convert Varda district into Gandhi Jilla because that's where Varda is where Mahatma Gandhi spent a lot of his time. She said, you convert Varda Jilla, Varda into Gandhi Jilla. And she asked me to chair a group. The report is available. And uh, how, what is Varda, what is Gandhi Jilla? What, what define Gandhi? <laughs> just, does we, just, do we just change the name of the district from Varda to Gandhi? That was not the idea. So we decided that there should be nobody below the poverty line, not by doles, but by self Swadeshi approach. Whether it is Charka, we had one member of my committee, Nandini Joshi. She had done in Harvard PhD on Khadi, and she was a great blessing because she could immediately show what can be done with Khadi and so on. So it is an interesting report, and uh, there are some people who still believe. Ramakrishna Bajaj at that time told me we should not allow uh, the support to lie idle. It should become Gandhi Jilla. The name should be changed to Gandhi Jilla. Maybe someday it happens. But whatever it is, the idea of the Gandhi Jilla is uh, what we now talk about poverty and hunger. They should not be there. No poverty, no hunger. Uh, that should be. And then of course, like things like leprosy. Uh, in 1982, I was 1972 to 82. I was in the Bhavans, the Kashi Bhavan and the Yojana Bhavan. I was really, really tired of the <laughs> staying in the Bhavans. So when the, the, the then chairman of the Erie Board of Trustees, Clarence Gray, came to me in Delhi and said, "We have decided to offer you the position of DG I, Erie." I took it up, and uh, Dr. P. C. Alexander was then the secretary of. Uh, Indira Gandhi, and he said she is not going to allow you to go. Uh, anyway, you go and see her. Uh, uh, Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister. Indira Gandhi first said the same thing. No, no, you are indispensable. I can't allow you to go. Then I said, since you have said I am indispensable, I must go. And he, her, words, her words were, have I offended you? What did I say? I said, you said I am indispensable. I think I should go when I am wanted, not when I am not wanted. And therefore... <laughs> Uh, she said, you have my blessings. And that is how I went to Erie where Dr. Lada is the sitting in front of me here, the representative Erie here. So women and rice farming system, strengthening the uh, some of the work uh, which I did there, special work, uh, strengthening the NARS, so many new institutions, starting with China National Rice. Chinese didn't have a rice institute of a large nature. Sindri it is called, so China National Rice. We developed Myanmar everywhere, Vietnam, everywhere the rice institutes uh, in Africa too 
One was in Madagascar, the other was in Saka. Dr. Siddiq went there to start the work in Saka along the Nile Valley. Uh, first, uh, the, then the Paddy and Prosperity, the Rice Biopark, next, the, now uh, with the help of Dr. Ajay Parida and the Mrs. Araf, the one Dr. Pillayar, we are setting up at Myanmar, uh, at Nepito, the new capital of Myanmar, a uh, Rice Biopark, Rice Biopark. I believe we should also start Pulses Biopark and so on. We are developing a, uh, we are developing a program. This is designed to save and add value to each part of the rice biomass, such as rice straw, rice husk, rice bran. For example, if we give the data in India that we produce 100 million tons of rice, but the rice plant produces another 200 million tons of biomass, what are we doing with it? That is the purpose, because we need agriculture biomass for our energy, for many other purposes. There is a book, an excellent book by Dr. Nanding Bernardo, uh, on 50 years of Yeri, 50th anniversary. There is one chapter there uh, called the Swaminathan years. Uh, those of you who are interested, I, I mean, the whole book should be read, but it catalogs what special things I did. Uh, two things he has, in the title itself he has said, growth and sustainability. Growth with sustainability, in other words, sustainable growth. Uh, that was one of my uh, main messages. We should produce more but produce it without ecological harm, what I call the evergreen revolution. Then started MSSRF 1989 onwards. Uh, it has, I didn't expect it to become a very large institution, but it has become, thanks to its number of successive trustees, directors, and so on. This is your center here, where you are here. The one at Vyanard, and the, it's also on the outside, the right in Vyanard. The Koraput has become a very large center. Uh, where we have also the what we call the CSR from Mitsubishi Corporation. And then after the tsunami, with the help of the Tatas, we set up the uh, center at Pumpuhar, uh, Fish for All Research and Training Center. Then the Village Knowledge Center and the Bio Center at Pondicherry. There are the, these places we have our own, our own infrastructure, our own buildings, our own infrastructure. Why not, for example, we have uh, outstanding land where we are trying to look for funds for a very, very one innovative botanical garden, a botanical garden uh, which is a very innovative one. MSSR of research priorities, you all have the annual report. Coastal system is the first one we developed because I found in coastal areas uh, the foresters were working on cashewarina and so on. The fisheries people were working on fisheries, but there was no coordinated, integrated management of the coastal ecosystem. Biodiversity and biotechnology Eco-technology, GRD Tata Center just on the other side, agriculture, nutrition and health, information technology, capacity building and networking, gender and development as a cross-cutting scheme, and climate change adaptation mitigation. These are all some of the concentration of the MSRF work. And they have been there for a long time. They were not just a long time. Then we have been worried about what is called the South Asian Enigma, extraordinary economic growth, but population largely dependent on agriculture. Yet two out of five children stunted, women and children suffer more. These are UNICEF data, 2013, what is called the Asian Enigma or the Indian Enigma, which, go ahead. Uh, so we have now, with the help of DFID, there is a program called LANSA, Leveraging Agriculture for Nutrition. But other than DFID alone, our own work here on how to overcome uh, hunger, the zero hunger challenge, what Ban Ki-moon has said, by 2025 we must achieve zero hunger. Like what Brazil in some cases tried to attempt to, attempt to make it, they succeeded a large amount under the leadership of President Lula. President Lula started FOMI Zero, Zero Hunger Program. That has now become an international program. And there are three major dimensions of hunger we are attacking here. One is calorie deprivation, that means increased production. Second is protein deficiency very large program on pulses. Next year is the International Year of Pulses. Third is the micronutrient deficiency, where uh, one of the important approaches is, of course, biofortification, where Howdy, I think, is here today. He will talk about it more, but I will go through fast. Biofortification can be done by three ways. Naturally biofortified plants occurring in nature, biofortified varieties like water normal seeds and others have developed by high breeding, by breeding, 
Thirdly, genetically biofortified crops uh, like the golden golden rice, which Ingo Potrick has developed, and unfortunately <laughs> that led to a lot of problem. The golden rice, uh, who is adjusting? You are doing. The meeting the zero hunger challenge. Our approach is starting with panchayats, farming system for nutrition, nutrition literacy through what we call community hunger fighters. Uh, Dr. Raman Narayan has produced a very good training manual for hunger, community hunger fighters. Those who are interested can ask for copies of it. Then a genetic garden of biofortified plants in order to help in choosing plants for integrating the nutrition dimension in farming systems. All these are important at the local level, panchayat level. Then the state level, State Food Security Act. One of the good acts is Ch Chhattisgarh Act, which provides for both pulses and also iodized salt. But now there are multiple fortified salt also, not only iodine, but multiple fortified salt are available. The main, and then the national level, uh, state level, local level, national level, National Food Security Act is very important. It's a life cycle approach with special attention to the first thousand days of a child's life, recognizing the oldest woman in the household as the one entitled to receive the food support, thus giving explicit recognition to the role of woman in household food security, strengthening the food basket, widening the food basket to include millets, to include orphan crops, what we call orphan crops, and finally, uh, it's a right to food, it's a legal right to food. It is not a genetic garden of biofortified plants, this is the 150th anniversary of uh, Mendel, Gregor Mendel, uh, 1865. 1965, I was one of the invited speakers at the Mendel Centenary, Mendel Centenary celebration. It was in Bruno, in the same garden where the peace, the peace, 3 to 1, 9, 3, 3, 1 and so on. Those ratios were there. It was very interesting. It is outside the Bruno uh, uh, monastery where Mendel worked this year's 150th anniversary. In fact, they wrote to me, they were good enough to write the Zekoslav Academy. Will you again come to give the keynote address? I said, I don't, I curtail my travel and therefore, uh, please excuse me. But uh, centenary, I was there and they gave the mental sense. But what I mentioned is, naturally occurring plant like Moringa, many of them in the genetic garden of biofortified plants, very important for the food, food for nutrition, that is food uh, farming system for nutrition. People should know from where to get the vitamin A plants, where, they, where will they get iron rich plants, where will they get uh, other deficiencies and so on. Uh, millet diversity, this has been one of our very first program at Colley Hills. We found the millets were disappearing and they were being taken away by tapioca, cassava or tapioca as well as uh, uh, pineapple and therefore how to make the farmers continue to grow millets because in the noon meal program of government rice or wheat is given not millets are not given so only old people are eating so we coined the term conservation through commercialization finding outlets for market and today the new food security act includes also the millets as number one what one rupee per kilogram millets and the Karnataka government has uh, is buying a lot of ragi uh, otherwise there won't be demand for ragi and so on. And then uh, conservation, one, we developed two, uh, two acts here on behalf of the government of India. The first was the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act. The other was Biodiversity Act. The first drafts were prepared here in the foundation. And then the, uh, the committee, Sahib Sip committee, in the case of farmers' rights. We explained to them why farmers should give recognition. Farmer as a conserver, Farmer as a farmer itself and also as a breeder. Farmer as a breeder, farmer as a conserver and farmer uh, as cultivator. And many of them are women and they maintain uh, the curative diversity. Curative diversity is a term I coined for medicinal plants, for medicinal purposes. Cultural and curative diversity. And uh, you find Sunita Narayan had prepared a very good book on the, on the culinary diversity related to biodiversity. This is from Nirmal, uh, the hybrid by the Bajra, which has a high iron. It was one of those, the number two, the breeding side, the breeding. I mentioned to you the third one, the namely genetically modified biofortified plants like golden rice. 
uh, although I find Dr. A.K. Singh is having wonderful, <laughs> wonderful material, but still uh, the regulatory policies are not adequate. So recently the Philippines, Eri had grown this golden rice. Uh, people came and removed it. The NGOs came and removed it away. Uh, and so there's still a fear that it is, uh, it is harmful. So what now, instead of going through the uh, DNA, recombinant DNA technology, we can achieve the same purpose of transferring genes across sexual barriers and so on uh, by means of marker-assisted selection. Marker-assisted selection is also approved by FOAM for organic certification. Very important to have the organic certification also for marker. Similarly, the new genetic, genetic uh, editing, uh, genome editing, CRISPR technology is now becoming very popular. Particularly in the animals, it is becoming extremely popular. And desired mutations of intended specific genes. This used to be Professor Keshavan and I, many others who are here. In the 50s, our whole uh, aspiration was directed mutagenesis. How do you get, get directed mutagenesis? How do you get a mutation you desire? But now we can do it. We can now do it. The specific genes can be altered. Anticipated research, this was one of our first first among our programs, uh, which was supported by the Japanese government, uh, uh, the whole res restoration of mangrove ecosystems and so on. Uh, otherwise, you have a large number of problems. In fact, according to the IPCC, there are only two things which are certain. One is temperature rise. Whether it will go to two degrees more or three degrees more, we don't know. Three degrees will be disastrous. Uh, or even two degrees disastrous, it will reduce uh, wheat production by five million tons in the North India. But the other thing is sea level rise for a variety of reasons, uh, the melting of the ice, uh, the whole area and so on. So we started, uh, we have started here a large program on anticipated research for sea level rise. Mangrove, conservation of the mangrove ecosystem was one of our first jobs and Dr. Shelvam who is here and his colleagues have done a tremendous job in uh, restor restoring degraded mangrove systems mangrove, people didn't realize what all uh, benefits it confers, the multiple benefits it confers, uh, it root exudate. Then we also found many of the coral reefs are disappearing and therefore uh, how to resurrect them. The artificial coral reef, the CMFRI of ICR, Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, had developed a method by which artificial reef can be produced. But nobody adopted it in practice. We were the only ones to create an artificial reef in Gulf of Mannar. And today if you go there, uh, enormous resurrection of fish, fish breeding, fish has come. So we should have uh, Lek and the Andamans and Lakshadweep Islands also. Uh, my granddaughter wants it very much badly. She is Dr. Samaya's daughter. She is a marine biologist, Shreya. She says we must have more of artificial reefs. Then genetic garden of halophytes, because we need halophytes to provide the genes for uh, for salt tolerance and therefore how do you how do you conserve them that's a very important area uh, we have a for the first time established a genetic garden of halophytes then uh, how to you see water farming see water farming the best thing is to learn from what farmers have done one area where it has been done in Kutanad in Kerala where farmers over 150 years ago developed a method of uh, cultivating rice below sea level. We, it is coconut, on the f or coconut along the borders, one rice, one fish, uh, fish com combination. This has been recognized by a few. The documentation was prepared by us, Dr. Anil Kumar, who is here. Globally important agricultural heritage site, GIAHS. There are only two areas. One is Koraput, the other is Kutanad. These two only have been recognized so far as globally important agricultural heritage site. It's not enough. Uh, one of the uh, Zero Hunger program also emphasizes on food safety. Food safety, food losses, and uh, a problem with our fisheries is uh, they don't have the infrastructure for very hygienic. Many of our fish exports are rejected because of salmonella infection. Therefore, after tsunami, we, we requested uh, the Tatas, in addition to building houses, uh, can you give us money for a center for training? It's called Fish for All Research and Training Center. The only one of its kind existing in this country at Pumpuhar. And you see the ladies here, these are all fisher ladies. 
the husbands bring the fish to the shore, then these people take it over and then they handle it until it is marketed. Uh, that process between capture to consumption, we have to see the safety of the material. Well, finally, uh, our program of information technology, Village Knowledge Center, yesterday <laughs> Dr. Bruce Albert showed one of his early visits in a temple in, 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 in Pondicherry uh, emblem, uh, how uh, Village Knowledge Center, uh, he saw it where operated by local women and he said it influenced his own thinking in terms of uh, transmission of knowledge. We also created, with the help of uh, the Tatas, a Jamshaji Tata National Virtual Academy. These academicians are 8th class, 10th class. They are not highly educated people. In fact, we get application from PhD saying, will you elect me a fellow of the academy? I said, this academy is not for uh, your biodata. It is not for adding one more academician to the biodata. It is for really people. Dr. Kalam, we invited him, a great man. He passed away, so that's why I put on two slides from him. He, he, I, when I went and asked him, what, he said, what is the academy? Who are these academicians and so on? Then he said, anyway, I will come. It was held in Pusa Institute, uh, Shinde Hall. And uh, he was so pleased with this academy. Then he post against the security people were always worried. But he just sat, sat in the steps of the uh, auditorium along with these lady academicians. Then he asked me one question before going. When is your next convocation? I said, next year. Will you invite me also? <laughs> I, I said, this is, of course, a unusual request. Normally, <laughs> each convocation is addressed by somebody else. No, no, you invite me, I will come. And uh, next one shows he did come. This was held in the APAU, Andhra Pradesh Agriculture University. Second convocation, along with the academician, he came and gave a very inspiring talk. Very unusual man. Very. That's why he's called People's President. Uh, we want to. We paid a tribute here because he was a great friend of the uh, foundation. There are a number of the Fisher Friend is one of the new technologies with uh, with the help of Inco's uh, in Hyderabad and Intel. Uh, you now these people were very afraid. These are small scale artisanal fishermen. They are afraid to go to the sea, but now they have on their mobile phone information on wave heights where the fish are and so on. They check it up before entering the boat. Uh, that's why it's called a Fisher Friend application, information on wave height. It's a transformational technology, transform their attitude. Well, uh, this is, this is, we have a program I mentioned to you about to the whole area of uh, coastal area development. Uh, we thought on the occasion of the uh, 80th anniversary of the Dandi March, a similar march took place in Tamil Nadu at Vedaranyam. Uh, it was run, it was, it was, uh, there was Gandhiji, here it was Rajaji plus one Sardar Vedaratana Pillai. Those two arranged, those areas are all, Tamil it's called Uppalam, uh, salt manufacture. But the salt manufacture, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, I don't think she, I saw her here. Uh, when she visited here, is she somewhere here? Yes, yes, she's somewhere there. <laughs> Incidentally, although she's my daughter, she's the new DG of the ICMR. Yesterday only the appointment was made. <laughs> Director General of Indian Council of Medical Research and Secretary Ministry of uh, research, Health. Health Research. <laughs> health, health Research. Uh, well, uh, she, said, she suggested you are doing so much work for the uh, for, for those areas. Look at the health of these people. That is how, in a small way, uh, we started work on health. And fortunately, the Tamil Nadu government, which is in a way, in terms of social protection, fairly advanced than many other states, they accepted, recently included, all self plan workers under the Chief Minister's Comprehensive Health Insurance Scheme. Otherwise, these ladies lose their eyesight. It is you know, such a strong reflection the salt, the, the heat and so on. But all this all right, <laughs> a lot of things have been done but no time to relax. Avoiding food losses and food waste, very high, 1.3 billion tons of food grains are lost. Climate change is a mega, mega threat to future of agriculture. Shrinking per capita land and water resources. Land is going out of agriculture all the time. Same as water. Expanding biotic and abiotic stresses. Adverse cost risk return structure of farming, uh, economics of farming, 
Yeah, but finally, market volatility, but finally, the reluctance of youth to take to farming. It's very important. The next generation of people, unless there is a technological upgrading of agriculture, they will not join. The unfinished challenge, I put, uh, when I put an adventure, <laughs> it, I took the challenges of the last 25 years in my own career, but the most unfinished challenge is ending the alarming state of malnutrition in India. 30% of children under 5 are stunted, 15% under 5 are wasted, and 40% of women of reproductive age are underweight, that means low birth weight child, and 40% of women of reproductive age are anemic. How to respond, how to bring agriculture, nutrition, and health together. That's the only way we have to in the future. There are six basic principles on which this foundation is uh, operated in the last 25 years. Adopt a pro-nature, pro-poor, pro-woman and pro-sustainable livelihood mandate. Build an institution without wall. Uh, this first one was taken by, uh, uh, by Dr. Gus Peth uh, when he was uh, chairman of UNDP. He borrowed it for describing human development, pro-nature, pro-poor, pro-woman and pro-livelihood. Build an institution without walls. Concentrate on brains and not bricks. I've been telling ICR, you see, so many beautiful buildings have come here, but there is no faculty inside. <laughs> there no, the students are all, you know, so by concentrating on buildings and not on brains, your faculty position will be very bad. Concentrate, organize anticipatory, participatory, translational and strategic research. Be dynamic and open to change, especially responding to new challenges created by climate change, world trade agreement, globalization of the economy and malnutrition. Link science and society through partnership with rural, tribal and fisher families. This is a very important part, part of our work. Uh, participatory research, partnership with rural, tribal families. These are some of the basic principles. Finally, you can have principles and so on, but as I said, only people can implement them. Not the uh, bricks cannot implement them. So we have been very lucky. Saying, this was a picture, old picture. It was taken not recently. One of the earlier pictures of the uh, when we got the uh, when we got the Blue Planet Prize. Uh, these were the staff members who were there in the auditorium. Uh, the women and men who help us in the villages, trustees. But above all, the trustees who are uh, you know, a trust is a trust must be trustworthy. And the trustees are the custodians of the mandate of the institution. This is again an old building. Some of you can recognize Dr. K. Kanungo here. He was a very important trustee. Dr. Shamsundar Nair. Dr. V.K. Ramachandran, I am told. I just saw him on the veranda somewhere here. He, was, he is there. He was one of the early trustees. The original trustees were only three. Dr. Chopra, who is here. Dr. V.K. Ramachandran and I. Gradually, Anuradha Deshai is here, Usha Barwale, uh, very, one of the outstanding women scientists. Uh, she is a member of her, was, oh, she was also chair of the program committee for several years. And of course, Soumya was uh, also a trustee at that time, who was there. She looks different in this picture. All of us will look different. Anyway, I want to acknowledge on this occasion the scientists, staff and scholars, as well as the tribal and rural families and the trustees and the support of the donors of the institution. I should have put also the donors. They are also very important. They are builders of the institution. Otherwise, without money, you can't do anything at all. You know, when I was president of IUCN, I used to say, conversation without resources is... conservation without resources conversation. We have very good conversation, but you can't... you have no money for do what you want to do. So all of them are important, and this occasion I want to acknowledge their continued guidance, help, the trustees, the donors, the staff above all, the scholars. We have very many large number of students who are doing their PhD. All of them I thank, and I thank you again, Dr. J. Parida, for putting me for time for in this program. Thank you for all of you. Thank you.